woke up tomorrow with superpowers, what would be the first thing you'd do? Let's say you could fly further than any plane, run faster than any speeding bullet train, leap over entire buildings in a single bound. Imagine being able to sneeze so hard you destroy an entire solar system. Yeah, no, that wasn't a joke that actually happened in the comics. Let's say you could run through walls, hear sounds from around the planet. Let's say you were immune to all diseases, you physically could not break a bone, break a sweat, or suffer so much as a scratch. Let's say you never had a legitimate reason to draw blood, or lift a building from the ground, or fire laser beams from your eyes, or freeze anything from just a chilling exhale. Pretty exciting stuff, right? Just think of your potential, soaring over the world and defending the unfortunate and inspiring hope and confidence for a brighter new day for everyone. Think of the religious implications. I mean, after all, so much of our world is dictated by belief in a higher power. Superman is a very empathetic character, and so for him to use all of his powers for the good of mankind automatically positions him as a messianic figure in a religious landscape. But now there's the discussion of his own political governance. Just because he can act doesn't mean he should act. Though these aren't necessarily the implications that Superman fans look for in a movie or adaptation. Traditionally, Superman is the man in the sun, the personable, resilient, friendly everyman. My favourite iteration of Superman comes from a show called Justice League Unlimited, wherein Superman is exactly as I've described. It's Superman at his peak, leading the Justice League, and although he goes through his fair share of trouble, he always comes out of it smiling. So you can imagine my disgust, my resentment, when this character that I grew up with and love is taken in an unfavourable direction. And you see, really connecting with something is no easy task. So amidst this hatred and disgust that I now had for this new iteration of Superman, laid one immovable foundation for why I could tolerate it. Intrigue. Snyder's Superman had butchered everything that I loved about the character, and if nothing else, it fascinated me. And within that, I found something that I could truly connect with. It was that spark of intrigue, the why behind it all. I would soon come to realise that stuff that I absolutely adore and admire always, always start off by being things that I entirely loathe, the things that I hate with a passion. And it's from that place of passion do I eventually come to terms with a rationale for understanding, an ability to empathise with the content and, by extension, empathise with the director's intent, their own ideologies and beliefs, regardless if they contradict my own. For example, do I agree that Batman should be a gun-wielding, bloodthirsty, morally ambiguous vigilante? No, not at all. In fact, I think that perfectly describes the Punisher or just anti-heroes and anti-villains in general. But in the context of servicing a uniquely fresh depiction of the character set within its own established theories and ideologies, I can suspend my own beliefs. I feel like that's an important thing to do in order to empathise with the director's beliefs and consequently come to terms with understanding their content and the thoughts and beliefs that drive their work. After all, no director sets out to make a bad movie, and Batman v Superman is by all means not a bad movie. It's still shot incredibly well, the dialogue serves its themes and characters brilliantly, the score is phenomenal and the action is amazing and the acting itself can be really compelling. Thinking in retrospect, I didn't dislike it because it's inherently a bad movie, I disliked it because I couldn't agree with these depictions of the characters that I had passionately held dear to my heart, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. As I said just before, although I love Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, they do not represent my favourite depictions of these respective characters. But I don't think it's fair to hate something just because you refuse to understand it. And although this might and probably isn't the case for you watching this right now, I initially disliked Snyder's take on these characters because I physically couldn't wrap my head around why they behaved the way they did. I was so caught up in what they did and didn't do that I refused to acknowledge why they did and didn't do those things. It was just easier to join the bandwagon and write the movie off as a failure. So, in an extremely meta way, I feel like the general audience's response to Snyder's characters reflect the exact mentality that supplement the themes of his movies. It's all well and good to examine why something doesn't work. If a director contradicts everything that we know a character to be, don't we owe it to ourselves to understand why it's different? We gotta know how the character is supposed to act so that we know why he's different. Look at the context of the world the character exists in, the time of the story, the direction of the plot. I'm not saying that this difference can or should appeal to everyone, I just find it fascinating that the director has made a conscious effort to try something different and new with something so iconic and safeguarded. So what exactly was it that drew me to love this take on Superman? At its core, it was the idea, the ideology, the belief that this version of the character could exist right now. See, I don't think Zack Snyder is a bad director, nor do I think he makes bad movies. While his world concepts and action set pieces are very expansive and otherworldly, his character concepts and themes are grounded in realism and human. 
And at the heart and soul of his stories are the characters and their conflicting beliefs, whether their beliefs are at conflict with other characters, the overall theme of the movie, or even the world in which they exist in. These beliefs are realistic because they each explore an element of human nature. Above all the super-powered extravagance that is Superman, it's the relatable human side of him that makes him likeable. It's the idea of having an outsider adapt to our human ways with compassion and understanding. It's the idea of him standing above humanity, not in tyranny or superiority, but as a symbol of leadership, hope and peace. And whether that's a discussion that you want to see in your blockbuster superhero movie, or something you'd rather see in an obscure indie film, the discussion itself is an infinitely rewarding one to have. And the thesis behind this video is the question that the movie proposes about one third into the narrative, and that is, must there be a Superman? For politics sake, for religion's sake, does Superman have a place in the modern human world? The scene is a short montage showing Superman saving citizens and protecting the innocent. It doesn't show him stopping crime or locking away bad guys. It shows his humanity and the ideal that Superman represents. Yet, while all this is happening, the normal and hopeful Superman theme is melancholy and hopeless. He isn't excited to be using his powers for the benefit of mankind. Instead, he's feeling desperately alone and isolated. That which gives him the power to unite the people he loves, in turn separates himself from them. He won't ever belong. His actions, no matter how noble, are a message that he has the power to do whatever he wants. And think about this from the perspective of the people. Think about it from our perspective as a human race. Everything that we know today defines how we behave as a species. We are at the top of the food chain. We control our planet. We have the power to do whatever we put our minds to, and this is our world. This question marks the contention point of Superman's arc in Zack Snyder's DC storytelling. He's taken the grand spectacle of a man whose powers are seemingly unlimited and given us the human perspective, the human rationale. Humans now have two choices. We must either adapt to this change or attempt to control it. And this attempt to control it takes several forms throughout Batman v Superman. First, the Senate and their hearings are called in order to dictate Superman's utility in their society. They're not arguing that he shouldn't act, they're arguing that he shouldn't act unilaterally. That in order to shore themselves of his cooperation, he needs to be governed and he needs to obey by their rules. On the world stage, this would incite fear. Would the humans consider Superman an American citizen? A threat to America? A threat by America? Of course, Superman reflects American militarial beliefs. We just don't see it because in this context they're reflective of humanitarian beliefs. Not inherently bad, just on a political stage reflective of American ideals because that's where he lives. It's no different to Red Sun Superman reflecting Cold War Russian beliefs because he was born and raised among their culture and ideologies. Not inherently evil, just another potential weapon in a country's arsenal. These aren't questions that people generally think about while watching a Superman movie. It's just a really dark and gritty concept to have sitting in our minds while we watch an altruistic alien fly around stopping crime and inspiring hope. And of course we know how Zack Snyder's DC Universe is different. Superman is pessimistic. Batman kills people. If you go to watch this movie expecting to see Justice League Unlimited Superman, you'll be disappointed. If you go into this movie expecting to see Justice League Unlimited Batman, you'll be disappointed. It's easy to know how Superman is different, what with his lack of smiling, lack of vibrant colours and general lack of optimism. But what's stopping us from exploring why Superman is different? And to answer that, we need to grasp how the world moves around Superman. We gotta think about how Superman was introduced to Zack Snyder's world. Not Clark Kent, Superman. The symbol, the hero, the god. The reason why so many people can buy into Christopher Reeve's Superman as the fun-loving symbol of peace to the people of Metropolis is exactly because of how he appears to those people within his cinematic universe. That version of Superman had the chance to ease into the escalation. His exposure to the people of Metropolis started with petty crime, from the lower level criminal stuff to the high powered villains. But that's exactly it. These movies paced out its threats to elevate the stakes. Zod didn't appear before Superman until Superman was already an established hero and saviour in those movies. He had the chance to prove himself to the people from those low-level man-made threats to say, yeah, I'm a good guy, I'm on your side. But how exactly does Zack Snyder's Superman get introduced to the people of Metropolis? Oh, yeah.
This is how Superman was introduced to the people of Metropolis. There was no escalation. There was no time to breathe. Zod was an abrupt, immediate, world-ending, super-powered threat that forced Superman out of hiding and onto the world stage. If ever there was a time and place for Superman to emerge onto that world stage as a hero, this wasn't it. And that's exactly the point. Superman wants to inspire hope, but now the world is dictated by fear. You gotta remember, Clark was a ghost until Zod invaded Earth. The first time the humans learned about his existence among them was when they were told that he'd been hiding there for years. There's no real way to prepare the world for Superman, so how could you litigate the damage from his first exposure to mankind? From Zod's invasion, how could you convince people that Superman is good? Superman never gets his chance to actually be a hero to these people, and when he eventually does, he's criticised. People are left to wonder if his actions are even entirely good, and if he is a reflection of humanity and human values, then is that something that we should trust? Because humans are deceptive, they can be just as ugly as they are good. The argument stands in the disbelief that there is no such thing as being completely good. Uh, the, the problem of, of evil in the world. Uh, the problem of absolute virtue. The problem of you on top of everything else. You above all. So how do you defeat a truly invincible, personable, shining beacon of hope? You don't use a fist. You don't even use harsh politics. If you can isolate Superman and convince the people he lives to protect to abandon their faith in him, you take away everything that he stands for. In a world where he is quite literally alienated from every other living being, being able to relate to their humanity is the single foundation that allows him a chance to live among them. So when that is taken away from him, not by force, but through considered manipulation and justifiable fear, he too can lose faith in himself and what he believes he stands for. Lex Luthor weaponizes Superman's own ideology against him, and yeah, I agree that his actual plan in Batman v Superman seems a little too far-fetched and hinges a little too far on the unpredictable nature of human emotions, but that is actively taken into account when Lex forges not one, but two silver bullets. Two deterrences. Firstly, the kryptonite, and when that fails, doomsday. See, Lex is as much a victim of this fear and hatred for Superman as he is an instigator of it. He's as terrified as the average citizen. He's just in a tyrannical and fortuitous position to actually do something about it. Like Batman, Lex is radicalized by his fear and can take his own extreme countermeasures to eliminate Superman. Everything significant about Lex's fear and consequent prejudice for Superman is reflected in his monologue. See, what we call God depends upon our tribe. Clark Joe. Because God is tribal. God takes sides. I figured out way back. If God is all powerful, he cannot be all good. If he is all good, then he cannot be all powerful. And neither can you be. He doesn't believe that someone with Superman's power can act selflessly, without bias. He's jealous that someone like Superman exists in a world where the very profit of power is unbalanced and fragile. His humanly sense of worth and utility is challenged. No, theoretically attacked by a physically superior being. So to compensate for this imbalance of power, Lex needs to make Superman an ethically inferior being. To turn the world against Superman, Lex takes a manipulative approach, planting evidence to paint him as a murderous and uncontrollable psychopath. Which, from the perspective of the humans inhabiting the world in this story, is already a deeply political and religious controversy. Suddenly, the figure that people are comparing to the Christian God is supposedly killing people? If everything people knew about their God being peaceful and merciful was just directly, publicly exposed with frighteningly real evidence, imagine the fear. Imagine the doubt of their own religion. His existence has essentially made religion obsolete. Why do you think there's so much not-so-subtle Jesus imagery and allegories in Superman's arc in these films? Lex takes these threads that dictate people's lives through choice or by law and weaves them tightly around Superman with ease. He didn't even have to do much, just plant some evidence, give people a platform to speak and let Superman's own actions or inactions fan the flame. An environment has been created where Superman can literally do nothing without generating a fear and hatred for him. If he chooses to act, it's political. If he chooses not to act, it's political. If he does the bare minimum by his own morals, he's scrutinized by an entire human race who are skeptical and angry. It shows just how fragile their world is. Just by introducing one element into the equation that humans have no control over, everything they've built towards is flipped on its head. 
We have a world governed by heads of states, elected officials. We as humans have control over who is elected into that power. Because of our ability to communicate and collaborate as a species, we sit atop the food chain. That is exactly the crux of this, power and control, and consequently a struggle. Because when a god lives among the people who could at any point destroy the entire world and there wouldn't be a single damn thing that we could do to stop him, it disrupts the order. He brought the war to them. And that's where Batman falls into the story. Not necessarily as a protagonist, well, not initially, because every action he takes up until the final act of the movie isn't at all heroic. Because he feels what he's doing is the right thing to do, eliminating this threat that honestly terrifies him. Yeah, Superman is the first thing since his parents' death that truly frightens him. As Bruce said, there was once a world with diamond absolutes, a world where insanity was dictated by human nature. It was predictable, systematic, justifiable by terms of injustice. But now, Superman exists. Someone whose very existence has vilified Bruce's understanding of his world. Superman's very existence negates all of Batman's contingency plans. After all, his greatest ally is his prep time, his chance to examine a threat and dominate the situation. But now, someone exists who Bruce can't prepare for. A threat that, for the first time since his parents' murder, he doesn't know how to beat. On a wider scope, Superman's mere existence contradicts all religion. His actions contradict all politics. His ethics are unknown to the wider world. Who dictates his authority? Do we even have that kind of power over him? Who is he? What is he? If you don't believe that people would be just as terrified of him as they are or struck with glory, just look at Homelander or Brightburn. They reflect the worst case scenarios of Superman from personal and politically engaged standpoints. But we as the audience know that he won't do that. We know that Superman won't turn evil and kill everyone on just a whim. We know that because, well, other than being a superhero, he was raised by Jonathan and Martha Kent. They always serve as the morale boosting voice of reason. Superman doesn't owe the world a thing. He could live selfishly. He could never use his powers, or he could use them for bad deeds. But that's just not who he is, and that isn't owed to his lineage or even his upbringing. That's owed to the inherent goodness in his heart. But this fear that the world harbors for Superman is exactly Jonathan Kent's concern with Clark choosing to act on his goodwill as a child. Remember that time when Spider-Man put his life on the line to save a handful of people in a train? Remember how they rewarded him with compassion? Remember how they empathized with him and vowed to keep his identity a secret as a thanks for saving him? How exactly did that end for Clark when he saved a school bus full of drowning children? Oh yeah, that's right, with superstition revolving around Clark's powers. He was called a freak! Instead of this mother being grateful, she's spiteful of him. And this opens the dilemma concerning Clark acting on principle or willingly remaining uninvolved to preserve the secret of his powers. Not for his sake, but for the sake of the people who are susceptible to fearing what they can't understand. Which would later be displayed as a major plot point driving the politics of Batman v Superman. Because you gotta remember, Superman is who he really is. Clark Kent is the alter ego. Clark Kent is the mask. So then we get to the obligatory death of Jonathan Kent. In most, if not all other iterations of the character, he's been killed off due to a heart attack or a stroke. Something that no one can control. It's a deliberate choice to make Superman look and feel powerless to save him. It's used as a point to accept the things out of his control and move forward. However, Zack Snyder instead put Jonathan Kent in a situation that Superman could very easily save him from. And that's exactly the point. It's no longer a discussion of can he act, it's should he act. It's not important whether Jonathan was right or wrong in telling Clark not to save him. What was important was what Clark learned from it. The will to act, the consequences to consider. To what extent or how familiar was he with his powers at the time? Did he even know he could save his dad? Should he save his dad and risk the world finding out about his powers? subsequently accelerating the people's fear that would later burden his life? Or should he let his dad sacrifice himself for the sake of keeping that peace? In the very essence of this dilemma of choice, it's also teaching Superman an unhealthy lesson about taking the burden of the world on his shoulders. It's teaching him to take accountability even for the things out of his control, such as a planted lead-lined wheelchair bomb killing hundreds of government officials. So to his knowledge, he is actively ignoring these threats and again taking on this depressing burden of death. And what's worse is that the people blame him for it too. He's in an inescapable position where even he is beginning to believe that he is to blame for the things out of his control. Jonathan Kent's death is deliberately made into a situation that Clark does have control over as to later reflect his self-destructive obsession with blaming himself. It's going to later inform his decisions to save lives, such as sacrificing himself to stop Doomsday which, in turn, would reshape the people's perception of him. 
the world changed when Superman flew, it changed again when he didn't. If you want to know the essence of Superman's place in Snyder's world, it's in this choice. If you want to see the true pain that haunts Superman in these movies, it's the fear and hatred that people have for him. If you want to see the impact of Superman living among the humans, it's the politics surrounding his every move. If you seek his monument, look around you. The only thing driving Superman forward every day is the promise of hope. The chance to live with peace, the wise words that his father told him that although the people of Earth will hate you, although they will stumble and fall, one day they will join you in the sun. Now look, I ain't about to sit here and tell you to like this version of Superman. I just think that it's an interesting and definitely a warranted discussion to be had when talking about the character, because this is certainly a darker, grittier adaptation of Superman. It's confronting and confusing because it serves as a reflection of our world today. I honestly believe that if a Superman did exist among us, this is exactly the kind of dilemmas the world would be facing. Every action he makes, good or bad, broadcast to the world for speculation and agendas to form, fear to circulate, hope to be discouraged, belief to be in question. Not necessarily for bad, but not necessarily for good. The very politics of this god, whose country he serves, whose morals he's defined by, all would dictate the wider global outlook on this seemingly messianic figure. There's a thin line betwixt optimism, skepticism, and pessimism concerning religion. Shackled by the obsessive and the possessive, testing the fragility of appearing impressive or oppressive, viewed religiously as omnipotent while challenged politically as discriminatory, Superman would not be allowed to act by what he thinks is right. He would be controlled, governed, ordered by the humans. His morals would be challenged, his sense of right and wrong at odds with his obligation to serve the people he loves. Guided not by the Kryptonian virtues of hope, peace and leadership, but changed to the human values of fear, vanity and hatred. But once he compromises his promise to adhere to our human values, the question will inevitably arise. Must there be a Superman?